Production IG is an animation studio with a bit of upper arm strength when it comes to pitching original works. For 30 years, their brand has been prestige, emerging at the end of the 80s with some of the most inventively original and beloved sci-fi franchises in anime history. They would also participate in critically lauded Gainax co-productions and get hired to do a bunch of video game cinematics in the late 90s, eventually delving into East-West collabs and artsier animator-driven projects in the early 2000s, letting Kenji Kamiyama run wild with some of the best written and most beautiful anime originals of the late 2000s, finally getting into TV anime in a big way with mixed results, and then seemingly out of nowhere producing long-form shonen sports and shoujo rom-com adaptations in the 2010s, while putting the rest of those genres to shame in visual presentation across some of those. Now at this point, the prestige brand may not be quite what it once was, but IG has never lost their reputation as the most well-respected studio in the business, because frankly there isn't that much competition. What's kept the studio so successful over the last three decades is their ability to work with strong intellectual properties, and it is in this fact that we arrive at the reason for Production IG's comprehensive business alliance with Netflix, and the creation of Be The Beginning. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In this world, there is not much room for new intellectual property. Every year, the small handful of giant media conglomerates who are still relevant anywhere outside of the internet grow even larger, buy out even more of the most valuable IPs, and then ram them down an accepting public's throat as hard as they fucking can for as long as they fucking can. Because Disney has inundated culture with Star Wars and Marvel heroes so thoroughly that creators find themselves giving up a major advantage if they don't try to ride the coattails of those properties in some way, they are a self-perpetuating hype machine, though one perhaps running out of steam in places. The more homogenized popular culture becomes, the more you literally cannot afford to miss an event piece or else be left out of the global loop. You have no idea how confusing the last five years have been for me as someone who stopped watching Marvel movies that weren't guarded after Iron Man 3. Production IG gets to work with some old, valuable, and prestigious IPs, such as Ghost in the Shell, Pat Labor, and now Fooly Cooly. But their favorites are the ones that they made up from scratch and have complete control over, like Psychopaths and Blood. And oh boy, we'll talk about how they marketed Blood another time, because they have milked the bare bones concept of that original movie far beyond what I could have possibly imagined at the time. Owning recognizable and versatile intellectual property is just about the healthiest thing an animation studio can do, as it allows them the opportunity to take a risk on marketing the thing themselves and then reaping all of the reward for it, which can lend rare stability to a studio if the things they own can continue to be profitable over a long enough period of time. This desire to maintain intellectual property rights is the entirety of why several anime studios are tripping over themselves to work with Netflix. Make no mistake, it has been corroborated several times, including by the director of Be The Beginning, that Netflix does not offer any greater budgetary advantages than is typical of TV anime. According to Studio IG's president Ishikawa, it used to be that when a studio made an original series, the production committee behind the show would get to hold on to its broadcasting rights for a few years, but eventually the rights would return to the studio, and if they so desired, they could expand on or market it themselves and reap the benefit of their creative success, in the same way that a studio such as Ghibli so effectively does. In the current system, however, this is no longer the case. At the start of production, each rights holder agrees to a percentage of the property's proceeds, but these percentages are never renegotiated, and the rights are never returned to the studio. As part of this comprehensive business agreement, however, Netflix is apparently doing things the old-fashioned way and returning the rights to the studio after a few years. And since they're willing to shell out the same budgets that the production committees are, and will put your work on the biggest, most popular stage in the entire goddamn world, why the hell wouldn't you work with them? How they marketed... I was paid at least $25 to advertise this. The modernist era of America began with the Civil War or thereabouts. It put an end to Romanticism. This is quite heavy stuff. 
for a PT Cruiser car review, but believe me, this is a good one. Once we exploded the atomic bomb and realized that all, everything man has built can be undone like that, why work hard? What's the point? <laughs> How they marketed. You'll notice that the studios who have been the quickest to make exclusivity deals and Netflix originals are those which pride themselves on their intellectual properties, and have been capitalizing on them harder and harder in recent years. If the deal wasn't sweet enough already, Netflix lets animators get away with way more crazy shit than they could show on Japanese TV, and doesn't put a hard limit on the length of each episode either. Well, it's not as though Netflix is some wonderland wherein you can do whatever you want and get paid for it somehow, in a conservative and stagnant industry like that of TV anime, even this amount of change is a huge deal for these studios. In President Ishikawa's interview, he's pretty insistent that these were IG's primary reasons for working with Netflix. When asked if the studio would be conscious of the show's worldwide distribution in the making of the work, he answered that they would not be, because productions that try to appeal to overseas audiences generally fail. Now, if this was how he felt, to the extent that he'd insist it in spite of the fact that series director Kazuto Nakazawa is best known for having directed the animated sequence in Kill Bill Volume 1 and the music video for Linkin Park's Breaking the Habit, both obviously Western co-productions as well as seminal pieces of nostalgia for me as a 13-year-old anime fan in 2004, this was in no way indicative of any desire to market the show towards a Western audience, then he probably should have said the same to Nakazawa himself, who stated in his own interview that he studied foreign movies, TV shows, and animations in preparation for working with that audience in mind. If this mix-up can really be blamed on a failure to communicate, then it wouldn't be the only time that it happened in the show's production. Apparently, while Nakazawa had been informed at some point that the entire show would be released at once, as is typical of Netflix, he straight up didn't believe it and went along developing the project as a weekly series. Perhaps Nakazawa's confusion was the result of finally directing his first ever TV anime after decades as a veteran IG animator and character designer. You ever have one of those times when you look up a guy's name that you've never heard of and then you realize you've actually been a huge fan of them for like 15 years? Well, prepare yourself because this guy was the character designer and animation director for Samurai Champloo, designer for Ashita no Naja and Zanko no Terror, and the action animation director for Kuroko's Basketball, which means he choreographed and animated some of those sick ass dunks! Even more impressive is a 25 year catalog as an animator, which, if asked, Nakazawa would describe as his real job. He would not consider himself a director, apparently, in spite of the fact that he directed what you might remember at the very least as Demolition D's favorite animated short film, Kigeki, which you should check out if you haven't for the reasons Demo already stated in that video. While you're at it, respect the greats and check out the shorts he made for the art house film collections Anikuri 15, Genius Parties 1 and 2, and the Japan Animator Expo. But maybe skip over his other OVAs. I guess it's not too surprising that Nakazawa doesn't consider himself a director when and his first attempt at a three episode OVA came out kinda shit. His 2013 OVA, Vassalord, was even more critically trashed, though I imagine it wasn't exactly made with the critics in mind. And frankly, besides the Linkin Park video, most of his music videos kinda blow. Granted, that's not to say that Nakazawa isn't a proven success. Aside from Kill Bill's modern masterpiece status, Breaking the Habit having been a hit video on MTV, and Samurai Champloo having been way more successful worldwide than it was in Japan, doing no small part to the iconic nature of the character designs, especially in certain markets, this guy is basically associated exclusively with his ability to crack the West. So how exactly did Nakazawa's research into overseas media manifest itself in Be the Beginning? Well, some things are pretty blatant, like the gimmick of representing master detective Keith Flick's deductive thought process via on-screen graphics exactly in the same way that it's done in BBC's Sherlock. Other things are a lot more subtle. While the character Lily Hoshina, for instance, may give the impression in personality and appearance that she exists as some kind of concession to the otaku market to put at least one cute moe girl in the show, not unlike the one which was made in giving the supposed
supposedly gritty and anti-cute psychopath Tsunemori Akane as the main character, I was shocked to learn that she had canonically had sexual relationships in the past. If that sounds like it shouldn't be a big deal, then you probably haven't been around Japanese otaku very long. Hell, we don't even need to get that specific here. In the first place, police procedural dramas are already one of the most universal television genres. Not to mention that near-future sci-fi procedurals have literally been production IG's bread and butter from day one. So this project was about as safe as it gets on the conceptual level. By far the most un-Japanese thing about Be The Beginning is its sound design. Much in the style of American shows and movies, the soundtrack is way the hell too loud, persistent, and generic. I know I'd be giving the show too much credit if I blamed all of the second half's lengthy panning shots accompanied by overblown thriller music on copying western sound design, but it's the sheer persistence of sound which plays into Japanese stereotypes about American media. In the behind the scenes documentary for the Skycrawlers, there's a bit wherein they interview the American sound design studio which Production IG collaborated with on the film, and the project lead talks about how he was shocked when director Mamoru Oshii asked them to leave a particular moment totally totally soundless, as this would rarely be done in American cinema. Now obviously it is no such oddity in the land of Mono no Aware, and I can't think of many anime which take this very heavy-handed approach to sound design, nor do I want to rack up a catalog. American studios don't operate this way because they think it's to the country's taste, they do it because everyone in Hollywood is convinced that everyone else in the country is a goddamn moron whose brain will shut off if you aren't constantly skull-fucking it with as much audio-visual information as you can. Granted, they are right. あれ、マーケット。肉を食っていれば人間は幸せになれるぜ。牛、牛、豚、鳥、牛、牛、内臓、内臓の順で食え。お前は少し痩せ気味だぞ。肉を食ってブクブク太れ。Welcome to the Not Quite Daily Show, Summer 2018, Episode 11, and today we are talking about an episode involving time loops. Welcome to the Not Quite Daily Show, Summer 2018, Episode 11, and today we are talking about an episode involving time loops. Welcome to the Not Quite Daily Show, Summer 2018, Episode 11, and today we are talking about an episode involving time loops. <laughs> How they marketed? Perhaps it was America's obnoxious attraction to aesthetics like that of The Purge, or maybe the worldwide popularity of stuff like It, Five Nights at Freddy's, and clown sightings, I guess, which inspired the designs of the villains. Otherwise, I don't know how much crossover there was between people who thought that B at first resembled the serious, high-quality sci-fi procedural they've been aching for ever since IG gave us this addiction in the first place decades ago, and those who want their villains to look like Twisted. The Western pandering which cracked me up the most, though, was having the ending theme performed by guitarist Marty Friedman. Sunday. 
For those of you who don't know about Japan's weird stable of cultural imports, Marty Friedman was formerly a guitarist for seminal thrash metal band Megadeth throughout the 90s, who moved to Japan in 2003 and somehow transformed into an iconic TV presence and music writer. In spite of having worked with artists like Revo of Sound Horizon, you know, the thing guy on stuff like the Bravely Default soundtrack, working with idol group Momoito Z, whose song featuring his guitar track was later used as the Sailor Moon Crystal OP, and even having composed a Kamen Rider movie theme, he had never outright composed an original anime song until now. And he didn't stop at one. They put together a whole Be The Beginning image album, including the ED, which actually features most of the band who did the Log Horizon OP, but nonetheless is boring and lame and sucks shit, as well as other features like Math Rock Outfit 9mm Parabellum Bullet. I'm kind of curious to listen to this thing, honestly, even though I think the ED sucks and sounds exactly like what I'd be terrified a Marty Friedman song would sound like. If they really did put Marty on this show just because they were marketing it to the West and thought, why not give it music from a famous Western guy, then that was just terribly misguided because no one in the West except for hardcore Megadeth fans has any fucking idea who he is. As much as I love to marvel at these false conceptions of what's popular overseas, I actually think that Be The Beginning does a better job than most shows which have international audiences in mind at keeping that fact relatively subtle and not sacrificing the identity of Japanese animation too much in the process. When shows like Big O Season 2 try to cater to their intended Western audience with things like accurate mouth movements, I find myself wondering if the studio somehow didn't realize that if this show was able to be renewed for a second season because Westerners enjoyed it so much in the first place, then the artwork and animation style didn't need to be altered to suit them better. They were obviously fine with it. Not to mention they lip synced to the sub instead of the dub. What the fuck? In his interview, Nakazawa insists that there is a higher demand for quality animation in the West, but given the overwhelming popularity of long-form shonen series and waifu horseshit with American anime fans, I think he might just be confusing them with the people who would come to a production IG panel at a convention, i.e people who actually give a shit. Nakazawa states in the same paragraph, after some stuff that Google Translate mangled too horribly for me to actually parse, that he prefers to aim for niche entertainment regardless, and I'm inclined to believe that he isn't wrong to characterize his approach to be the beginning that way in spite of its many concessions to accessibility. At the end of the day, the show is still extremely anime, to an extent that you could just as easily accuse it of pandering to any of the usual groups which anime pandered to. Amongst the edgy clowns are some true Chunibi champions, including Camp Yaoi Boy, Blushing Bishonen, and Misa Misa. On the flip side, they also included this blonde bombshell badass secretary side girl for people with taste. So did any of this pandering actually work? Did it make people want to watch the show? And just as importantly, was the team actually able to pull these discordant elements together and make a compelling series out of it? Well, I think a better question actually might be what Production IG or Netflix even expected from it in the first place. In the interview with President Ishikawa and the Netflix rep who coordinated this partnership, they talk about how this brand of multi-year contract is the kind of thing that they're always aiming for, because having the guarantee of handling multiple projects allows them more room to fail, or to experiment as it were. And even if they do strike out, their team will be stronger from the experience and ready to step up to bat again. As for how it went this this time, President Ishikawa certainly seemed excited about it, but then I would not expect the man attempting to sell his company's show to express any other emotion about it unless something went very wrong. At the time of the interview, it seemed as though the initial viewer response to the show had been fairly warm, and the men were hopeful about its ability to spread through word of mouth and Netflix recommendation feature. Yeah, good luck. Realistically speaking, there is little chance that Be The Beginning will ever be particularly popular anywhere in the world, because while the first few episodes are some of the most solidly entertaining and gorgeously produced anime that I'll be likely to watch all year, the rest is a narrative clusterfuck featuring an uncomfortable number of edgelords in clown makeup dropping episode-hogging backstory dumps. Then it devolves into one of the most flaccid, tensionless, and weirdly overlong climaxes among even the staunch competition from every other attempt 
attempted a serious thriller anime in recent years. In spite of President Ishikawa's claims to the series' shocking consistency across its run, the difference in how much animation and detailed artwork is seen in the first half of the show versus the second half is quite noticeable. But then that's only because the first half set the bar so goddamn high in the first place. You might expect that since the director slash character designer slash chief animation director has previously made possible some of the greatest fight sequences in anime history, you would get to see some of that in this show as well. And you do. Once. In episode 3. And it's so fucking sick! got me hype as fuck, but it didn't last long, and the fact that the finale's fight scene paled in comparison left me feeling real high and dry after bothering to sit through a plot which I increasingly gave less and less of a fuck about, and in turn had less and less of an idea what the hell was even going on. To be fair, even the main character's voice actor said that he didn't understand the script the first time he read it either. This show is a real problem with not making it clear which story threads and characters are going to actually matter, and which ones are going to be totally irrelevant to the main thrust of the season. That is, until about halfway through when it unfortunately pulls on mostly the characters I was least interested in to occupy nearly all further screen time. Overall, I would consider the show to be a pretty big disappointment, though it would have been even more of one had I actually known anything about it whatsoever besides that it was a Netflix original by Production IG before watching it. The external marketing for this series has barely existed, and word of mouth spread is likely going to be difficult considering the worst marketing decision they made on the entire show, giving it the title Be the Beginning. Far more than simply a boring, generic, and unmemorable title, Be the Beginning is particularly thoughtless in that it's not just badly optimized for search engines, it's downright broken. If you're like me, and you do most of your googling by way of Chrome's address bar, then you'll find it's not a big fan of typing in a single letter followed by a colon. Not to mention that names containing a one-syllable word followed by a colon and a longer, harder-to-type phrase will inevitably lead to abbreviation. But since the title is literally just a fucking common letter, no one will know what you're talking about unless you say be the beginning, which makes you feel stupid because you had to say that shitty title out loud. Where this becomes unfathomably frustrating is in that the fucking logo of the series very clearly says B4, and it would have changed the meaning of the title almost not at all to have called it B4 The Beginning, and now it's at least a cheesy pun. Moreover, in the show itself, we learn that the B is actually just the number 13. How about 134? How about 13? How about 13-4? How about literally anything else? The official Twitter for the show was created in January of 2018, a trailer aired in February of 2018, and then the show was dropped all at once on Netflix at the start of March, and that was that. It got an English dub full of all the usual fuckboys that I never want to hear speak ever again, a weird ass image album, I guess some little art installation of Genga drawings at some cafe, and the couple of interviews which I've cited throughout this piece, and that's about it going by the show's Twitter. It really doesn't seem like any of the relevant parties are trying all that hard to push the series, and there hasn't exactly been a groundswell of word of mouth push to make it relevant either, given that it scores about a flat 7.5 on pretty much every site that aggregates such things, and has been described to me by several friends who watched it as adequately watchable. Personally, I would advise applying the same strike and burn policy to this season as I would to season one of Shingeki no Bahamut. It's worth watching the first four episodes if you're an animation geek, but after that, it's not really worth holding on to. They're probably gonna make a second season, the name obviously implies it, half the major characters didn't even do anything or make any progress, and the ending even implies that there'll be a second season. 
update in the months I spent working on this video, season two confirmed. But personally, I probably won't even bother watching it unless I hear it's way better than season one. Otherwise, I'm just gonna watch all the sick ass Sakuga scenes on Sakuga Boru and strike the rest from my memory. decisions have led me. Free alcohol. We did it, guys. We fucking did it. That you want some more and I Jizz in my pants This really never happens, you can take my word I won't apologize, that's just absurd Kyra and Luno Hey Kyra, check out this trick Bongo taught me here I go. Wait. Shit. Damn, I dropped them. Give me a sec. Good job. Huh? I didn't even do the trick yet. Alright, look. This Amos Yee guy wants me to promote his video about defending pedophiles. Now, I'm not a pedophile. I have made a very clear distinction between lolly art and real shit. And I agree with the standpoint, at least, that shaming people for their thoughts is not okay. However, your actions are something you need to be held accounted for. And to argue, as this guy does, that just because sometimes, somewhere in the world, people have had sex with with underage people and it didn't go horribly wrong for them. To cherry pick those examples and then say, so it should be okay, is is pretty fucking obviously warped. I mean, I can't even go outside naked and that doesn't harm anyone. Like, that's just something that we've all agreed on that is just generally not a good idea, so let's just not do it. So, uh, don't touch kids. Just don't do it. I'm sorry that you feel the way you feel. Just stay away from it, because it's generally not a good idea. And cherry-picking examples of times that it didn't have hugely negative consequences, which is all fucking subjective anyways, uh, isn't helping your case. Sorry, Amos. But uh, anyway, if you want to see his video, it's on Facebook. I'm up on the roof at the Anime Expo Sitting with my dudes and we're getting real simple Got a sap full row in my mouth So you know I'm getting real fucked up coming out Got the school jazz band behind me Backing me up every night because they're my me Man, they're my dudes Everybody knows that I'm the motherfucking coolest Motherfucking cat around When I got my camera out then you know I gotta jam down At an Anime Expo Sitting on the roof at the West of Bonneville how it goes when you're a rapper then you gotta no, know bro. how to freestyle and i'm the master no, okay, bro. oh motherfucking disaster But wait, there's more! You might be thinking this video is not quite what you expected from how they marketed episode one. And that's because I decided this is not how they marketed episode one. This is the pilot because how they marketed as I originally planned it is not possible to continue as a series at this time, but now you can have a taste of what it could be if I ever decide to do it again in the future. And if I do, it will need to be independently funded. But anyways, the parts of this video that I had to cut out in order to make it make sense without being a part of the greater context of the How They Marketed series will be included slash explained, depending on which parts were actually done, in the Director's Cut edition of this video, which you can find on the Patreon, exclusive to my diglets. That's what I'm calling my fans now, apparently. And uh, you can go fucking become a patron, and that'll come up soon. Maybe it's already out. Maybe I'm waiting a day. I don't fucking know. I got other shit I gotta do. Anyways, as promised, though, here is me reading the names of people who remembered to submit a name 
to the how they marketed. So these people made this possible. Uh, Lord Liquid Bacon 2, Patient Bear Beta, uh, Those Timmies, he says that, I hope I got that right, because he says if I pronounce it right, he'll up his pledge to $100 a month. Good luck. Uh, the, it looks like those items, but the T is before, I'm going to say those Timmies, or Thosetimies, Thosetimis, possibly. I don't know if I'm allowed multiple tries, I just want that $100. Denial, Diego W. M., that's E-M., uh, Amos the Pedophile Ye. Connor Martin, Alex Olson, Fuero Dandy, Gast Station. Oh, that's funny. VQCD slash Julian My Julian. I guess he couldn't decide. Noah Smith, Raytish or R Rach. R it says it's pronounced like the English word rage. So rage. Uh, Timu Siro si Siertola. Timu Siertola. Um. Diego, Pete Talongson, SYU404, and Hemorrhoid Skankins. Hemorrhoid Skankins is how I assume that's meant to be read. Thanks to all of you and to anybody else who didn't submit a name in time, and to all of the $25 patrons who paid for all those ads. I had a lot of fun making all that shit. I'm glad to finally have this thing fucking done. Uh, see you tomorrow.